We have a live update from Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham on COVID-19 in New Mexico. Let's go now to... Uh, this is a mask that was made for me by Cooch Jacobus, a retired educator uh, and uh, someone who's been very engaged in policymaking through the state legislature on any number of issues. So thank you, Ms. Jacobus, for your great work. This is a gorgeous mask. I also want to show another one. This mask was also made by Cooch, and uh, Ms. Jacobus uh, pointed out that this particular material uh, is from a historic fabric designer named Kate Hall, and it's based on a painting that's in the Folk Art Museum here in New Mexico. So uh, as soon as we uh, uh, get a chance to go to those museums again, um, I'm going to look for this incredible painting. But it's a great way to highlight the other incredible aspects of New Mexico. So my Day of the Dead mask uh, and my Folk Art Museum mask, think mask. Thank you very much, Ms. Jacobus. Um, I appreciate your efforts. All right, I'm going to take off my mask. Uh, everybody else has their masks on uh, while we do the first slide, which of course is the case update. So we have 212 new cases today. Uh, that brings our running total to 21,773 cases. We have 138 hospitalizations, 28 individuals on ventilators. Uh, for folks who are viewing for the very first time, we, uh, hospitalizations is an important gating criteria, gating criteria, which you'll hear more about from Dr. Scrace. Make sure that we don't overwhelm our hospital system and we know uh, at any given time where we are so that we can serve not just individuals with COVID, but our hospitals have to be available to serve everyone who requires hospital care. Uh, unfortunately, we have two uh, new deaths to report today. That's 669. Uh, and again, uh, when I watch national news, which I know many of us do, and uh, really focusing on uh, the, the problems that the United States continues to have. Remember, we're 4% of the world's population. We're 25, 26% of the total cases. Our mortality rate is way too high. This is an indication, right, that every single American we lose, every single New Mexican we lose is a tragedy. Uh, and there, there are no words to adequately comfort their families. Uh, and their communities. Uh, and uh, we report those as painful as they are because we want folks to know uh, how serious and deadly this infection actually is. Uh, to date, we've done 604,382 diagnostic tests for COVID. Uh, we continue to uh, uh, diligently uh, broaden testing while keeping, and you'll hear about this, you know, a specific strategy in place so that we're focused on making sure that sick individuals who are symptomatic absolutely are both getting good medical advice and getting tests so we know uh, who has COVID and continuing also to do targeted testing in a way that's meaningful to stop the spread of COVID to the highest degree that we can. Um, with that, um, I think we're going to go to Dr. Scrace next, who's going to talk about, um, or actually I have my two slides first. Oh, I did it right. All right. I apologize, New Mexico. We're going to do the modeling and then back to, uh, and, and then to Katrina, with Secretary Hotram from Aging that uh, I hope doesn't need an introduction, but I'll do that again. And then back to me, I want to talk a little bit about our economic recovery, and then we'll be open for questions. Thank you, Nora, for keeping us on track. Dr. Scrace. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone in New Mexico. I have a couple topics I want to touch on today, so a, a few less graphical slides and a little bit more information about COVID in a couple different areas. Uh, if I could have that very first slide though, it's a heat map. We call it a heat map. On the left, you see the number of cases that have occurred in each county since the beginning of the epidemic here. We're on day 149 today. And on the right, you can see uh, the cases in the last week. On both maps, the darker red or orange it is, the more cases. And you can see actually right now in the past week, we're seeing more cases per day coming out of the Southwest than we are the Northwest, although Bernalillo and Doniana still lead uh, the state in their case counts this week. The next slide is a bar chart that shows a couple things that we talk about each time. Uh, first is the distribution of cases by age group. And those of you who've been watching regularly, regularly may remember when those four bars, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59 were just 
equal for months and months in terms of their percent number of cases. But now uh, the 20 to 29 age group is responsible for one-fifth of all the COVID cases here in New Mexico uh, over, the, uh, over the duration of the pandemic. And, and that means that there are even more than that uh, because the recent cases have been even higher. Uh, again, younger folks out, and then and we watch children. We watch watch their percentage, and and I, I, more probably, I should say, people between the ages of zero and 19, and they're totaling now uh, more than 15 percent again. So that's grown quite a bit in the past month, and we're and we're watching that closely. On the other hand, uh, death rates in the youngest age groups are very very low, still quite high in those over 80. And I'm going to come back to let you all know how we're doing at nursing homes in nursing homes in New Mexico here because our very early experience with COVID was a lot of cases in nursing homes, a lot of people seriously ill, a lot of complications and a large number of deaths. So the next slide just briefly uh, <clears throat> gives you a couple of statistics about nursing facilities in our state. We have about 10,000 of them, about half, uh, half of our resident, excuse me, about 10,000 residents in these facilities about half in assisted living facilities and half in skilled nursing uh, facilities. Um, about 6.1% of those almost uh, 10,000 facilities have had one or more cases of COVID. And you can see that much higher in nursing homes, 10 times higher a, per a percentage of uh, uh, cases in nursing homes than in assisted living facilities. You can see a little bit of data here about the total number of residents and staff in blue bars or nursing homes, orange bars are assisted living facilities. Uh, in particular, if you look at the resident cases and staff cases and resident deaths, you can see how those are distributed over the two types of facilities. At the very beginning of this pandemic, New Mexico was in the top five to 10 states in terms of numbers of cases in nursing homes fatality rates in nursing homes. And our theory was, uh, at the time, when we, we wondered why we were so high, was when was, we did have some couple, a couple very early outbreaks. Second was we didn't really believe other states were reporting. Our state participates with the CDC in a special reporting program. So we had all of this data already set up and being reported. So we reported quickly. And if you look at the next slide now, you'll see that actually that hypothesis probably is true. We've, done a great job. We, we closed nursing facilities to visitation very, very early on, and we said we weren't going to open them up until we thought it was safe again. And so, but you can see now that we're, instead of being in the top 10, we rank number 32 in terms of the, the rate of cases, number of cases per thousand residents in nursing facilities uh, a few weeks ago, and this was reported by CMS. And the next slide is another view uh, from a different source of uh, average deaths or the death rate in, in residents in nursing homes. And New Mexico is almost to the very bottom of the list. Uh, we rank 45th with, and that there's two states who aren't even reporting at all. So we've made great progress. We've been watching this closely. Uh, many of you know that I'm a geriatrician, so my work at the university before I came here was focused a lot in nursing homes as well. And so we, this is really good news because we think we're now getting to a point with the number of cases that we're seeing uh, that we have this under control. In addition, Secretary Kunkel has set up a rapid response team working with uh, Secretary Hotram Lopez from aging so that any time there's a case, a single case uh, in a nursing home, uh, we have a team that immediately goes there, tests all the staff and, and uh, all the residents to identify any additional positive cases. And I'm gonna talk about more when I talk about contact tracing, why that is so critical and why this intense effort on, uh, on the part of the state has really gotten us to the point where you're gonna be hearing more about visiting our relatives in nursing facilities later today. Uh, the next slide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a, little about a little bit about COVID related medical topics. I think a lot of folks uh, are understandably uh, wanting to stay home as much as possible and wanting to delay care, maybe in a hospital setting until uh, the pandemic is over, that would be a very, very grave mistake. If you look at the, 
Uh, data here, it's a pie chart from the Kaiser Family Foundation. You know, uh, about half of the public, 48% said, yeah, I've, I've delayed some of my care uh, because of the outbreak. And there might be things that could be moved out a little bit, but you know, I get an annual eye appointment. I had that in June. They were great. I mean, very safe. I felt safe. Uh, everyone had masks. Everyone was socially distanced. Our healthcare providers know that they have to do these things to keep you safe in order for you to come in and get your care. And so please don't delay your care. We have a lot of tragic sort of uh, anecdotes about people who did that, who uh, either suffered serious complications or are no longer with us. But just think about that. And if you're not even sure about whether you should delay or not, talk to your healthcare provider. Call your doctor, call your PA, call your nurse practitioner and say, what do you think? Uh, you know, I'm seeing patients again and it's basically one video visit after another. Uh, that's pretty safe. And I can do 98% of what I would do in a regular visit uh, over the phone or particularly with a, a video camera, which I, I prefer. Uh, and the last thing I want to point out on this slide is that of the group of people, that 48% uh, percent of people who postponed care, a quarter of them had their health care, get, had, their, had their health worsen because they delayed care. So just uh, do that inventory, look up when your last appointments were, make sure you're not overdue for important laboratory testing or uh, eye exams or visits with your doctor or tests to control your diabetes or get your cholesterol or checked up or talk about your heart disease. Very, very important. And I know personally, I am proceeding with my health care because I, I don't want to get behind or have issues that might come up later. Uh, the next slide. Uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of uh, text, or not text messages, emails from people who are telling me they're taking, it's taking them a really long time to recover from COVID and, and uh, that I ought to say something. I've been waiting for some data to come out. So I could say something about this that was based on some uh, medical literature, but actually the CDC now is uh, seeing that uh, the symptomatic adults, these are people with symptoms now at COVID, a, take long, th a third of them take longer than two to three weeks to get better. And so this can be a serious illness. Uh, you know, 70% of people sim with symptoms or without in a new study have some involvement of their heart. Well, that's kind of scary, particularly if you think that half of the folks could be asymptomatic. So, uh, and uh, even younger people, uh, even, you know, those 18 to 34, 20% of them had not got, gotten back to their usual state of health after uh, two to three weeks as well. So it's a serious illness. It's part of why we have a lot of unrecovered uh, individuals, not the only reason, but a part of the reason, and uh, wanted to pass that on to you. And then the last health-related issues on the next slide, and school is coming up. Hopefully in-person school is coming up very, very soon based on the, uh, what we're seeing in the data. And so, uh, but right now we're 20% behind school age vaccines for where we were in previous years. And you can see the last three years, we actually did a lot better as a state in 2019 than there's been a 20% drop. So another thing uh, is as we move toward uh, a, a state in New Mexico where it's going to be safe for kids to go back to school, please get them immunized now. You don't want to introduce another a delay in waiting for appointments and things like that. Let's get our kids immunized now. And it's important to get them all caught up for the fall flu season. I'll say more about that next week. Now we're, I'm gonna briefly talk about gating criteria. Uh, again, I mentioned I'd taken out some of the graphs because I wanted to talk about these health topics. So on the next slide, we have our How, I, How We Reopen Safely website. The good news is that New Mexico's orange now, uh, or dark, maybe it's just red but it's not that dark bruised red that we're, surround, we're, we're swimming in a sea of. Uh, and, uh, but we're, we're seeing good trends. Case counts coming down consistently. We were in the average of 300s um, just last week. We're now we're in the average of low 200s. This week, testing still staying up uh, in the green is positive. And we're getting a good rating on our contact tracing, which I'm gonna go into in a minute. Uh, we have now, the, uh, the next slide is the gating criteria chart. Uh, our spread rate uh, should be green, and I apologize for that. I, I cut and pasted some slides and some colors changed on me, but 
Our spread rate is low. It's 0.72. That's because cases are coming down. Our case counts are in the low 200s, uh, 204 to 220 uh, the past few days. We still don't have a target for that, but we will have that uh, by next week. Uh, looking all over the country, Harvard has a scheme that they use. Many other epidemiologists and states and countries have used different cutoff points. Uh, and so we're looking at, at that as well. Testing continuing to do great, uh, amazing efforts. And, the, and uh, with case counts coming down, our test positivity rate is coming down. Back to, you know, our target's five, but we, I think we all feel got more comfortable. And I, think, I know the governor feels more comfortable if we're below four and, and now we're down to 3.5. That's good news. Contact tracing is uh, in red. I'm going to show you a graph in a minute. And our hospital uh, supply, uh, our hospital bed status for ICU and it has been updated with more current numbers. Uh, but we we're good there as we are on the seven-day supply for PPE. Now, a couple of things on contact tracing. Uh, we had a big improvement last week. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I want to spend a minute on this slide. Uh, we changed our reporting method a long time ago. But you can see we're going along, and, and coincident with the dramatic rise in cases, we had a rise in, in the number of hours it took to contact those cases once we had the test result. We've been promising you for weeks that we're hiring new people. We have an automated system uh, coming up. We're getting more data, and all of that is coming true. And you can see that we're now very, very close to contacting our cases within our 24-hour target. This is important for two reasons. Number one is... Sometimes people get a test and they don't feel too bad, and so they decide to just go out anyway, and that's not a good thing. Uh, we know now that we're almost 50% of the cases we see in New Mexico did not have symptoms at the time they had their test. The second reason it's really, really important, so the first reason is we want to contact those people as soon as we can and get them to stay at home and, is and isolate themselves for another 10 days. The graph on the right is the amount of time it's taking us to reach the contacts of the cases. And uh, this is really a critical measure. First, I'll tell you what it shows. It shows that uh, almost a mirror image of uh, the, uh, the initial contacting the cases that we've dropped almost to our target. The reason this is so important is 50% of our cases are asymptomatic. So if we can find out everyone that a case has come in contact with and contact all those people, uh, uh, there will be people out there without any symptoms at all that have COVID. If we can diagnose them, we can then quarantine them and, frankly, all the contacts of these cases. This is how we actually stop the spread. And in the modeling team this week and Tuesday, I think it was almost a unanimous consensus that the primary driver of this drop in case counts that we're seeing now, uh, in addition to all the hard work New Mexicans are doing, wearing masks, staying at home, staying six feet away from each other, washing their hands, was the contact tracing is really working and we are finding and isolating people and preventing spread. Uh, so these are really, uh, on the next slide, uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about contact tracing. We told you we'd have more for you this week. And uh, really to reopen schools, to keep, our, well, to keep our cases down to where they need to be so we can reopen businesses and schools more, we have to do this contact tracing, and we have to be effective. We've already told you our DOH, uh, Department of Health, is, reaches over 80% of confirmed cases, which is, we still believe, the highest in the country. If they call you, please answer the phone. They will ask you where you've been the last few days and who you've come in contact with. We will not tell them uh, uh, who uh, you are if you had contact with them and you believe you may have exposed them unless you give us permission. And then it, also importantly, because this is starting to happen, it, the contact tracers will never ask you for social security number, credit card information, immigration status, things like that. They'll, they'll verify your date of birth, but they will not ask per, for personal information. And I've heard some anecdotal reports of scam contact tracers asking, asking for credit card numbers, so please do not uh, give that up. But this is really the key, not only to our, our driving the case count down now, but keeping it down going forward in addition to the hard work you're doing. So in closing, uh, as, you, as you know, I, I keep looking for a metaphor. Uh, next slide shows a tug of war going on. And on the right, uh, 
Oh, that graphic didn't come up. I'm sorry. So the graphic isn't up, but it's a tug of war, and it's the people of New Mexico, and then there's another group on the other side with little COVID viruses for heads. And we are in a tug of war with the virus. The virus is going to keep pulling at the same strength. We all need to pull together against that virus. We need to do the things that we know we need to do. We're, we're, in, we're in a stone's throw of getting our kids back to school. That's only going to work. If we, uh, if we pull together, we stay at home, we do the things we know we need to do, washing our hands, wearing those face coverings, keeping six foot distance. And, uh, and so, uh, and I would just beg people, based on what we saw after 4th of July here in New Mexico, to start planning now for a nice stay at home Labor Day weekend with the people you live with. Uh, this uh, last slide, we've got both the crisis ex uh, access line for those experiencing uh, or sensing they're in crisis. And this is Aubrey Drake Graham, otherwise known as Drake, uh, telling you in his own words what kind of plans you should make for Labor Day weekend. Just do that cookout with the people you live with. Don't get the family together. There'll be more time to do that when we're all vaccinated and we have the virus fully under control. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to our governor. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scrace. And so I'm going to reintroduce Secretary Hotram Lopez, who is the Secretary of the Department on Aging and Long-Term Care. And they have an incredible role in both supporting and protecting not just the residents as, uh, at long-term care facilities, but engaging with their families. The Department of Health also has a, uh, a role in regulating and the oversight of such facilities, but uh, Secretary Hotram Lopez is taking the lead in advancing, and we talked about this last week, visitation policies. And this is the, one of the highest risk efforts we will undertake. Uh, and as promised, uh, I made decisions from Friday to Monday about some of the parameters. And this is how that works. The evidence-based work of the medical advisory team, Dr. Scrace and his team, the uh, evidence-based policy work of the cabinet secretaries who are also part of the surveillance testing strategies. They have to show, right, what are the risks, what are the gains, how do you mitigate? Uh, and then I make sure that I understand how the science and the evidence-based strategies will get to the problem solving so that I can make a decision. That occurred Friday through Monday, uh, and now we want you to know what some of those parameters look like and how folks can start to think about ways to engage as safely as we can to put our loved ones and their family members in a, a situation where they can do more than window visits and more than FaceTime video visits. And right before I go to the secretary, I want to give this caveat that this is really important work. It's as important as getting the schools right. If we don't get this right, we will have spread and the folks who are really at risk, which are the residents and some of their spouses and family members, uh, people die, so that getting this right uh, must be done. Uh, and it is not an invitation for licensed facilities to open up and to change all of our very clear safe restrictions that Dr. Scrace has shown you have had an incredible impact on making sure that the safety and well-being not only of the residents, but of the staff who work there, who we need in order to provide that daily care. And so these are not open invitations. It's not about lifting all of our restrictions. It's not about being reckless. But this is a population that needs their families. And families can need to see light at the end of the tunnel for as safe as we can possibly make it, opportunities to introduce some visits. And so we want to show you what that looks like after those decisions. And you should expect us to talk to you more about it. And we're really going to need New Mexicans to do their very best here. Uh, because this is like schools. These are high-risk environments. And unlike schools, this is a population uh, where you can't contain once it's in very effectively. 
and we have the most vulnerable populations too being incredibly sick and losing their lives um, because of their chronic illnesses and their age ranges typically in long-term care facilities. So, uh, Secretary. Thank you, Governor. Um, good afternoon. So we have some exciting news um, to talk about some sort of additional visitation as the governor has talked about. Um, there have been a lot of, of, of individuals um, that have been working on what visitation should look like and again with the evidence-based approach and the, the testing and um, the, the, the positivity rates, we have come up with some guidance and a strategy from the state uh, at the state level on what we want to do and where we want to see visitation go at least in this first phase. I'd like to thank not only the long-term care um, MAT team that has both providers and um, medical professionals on there, but also um, the New Mexico Health Care Association and advocates such as the long-term care ombudsman. They've all been working on this for a long time to make sure that visitation, at least in this initial phase, is done right and that we minimize risk. So I'd like to also thank the governor because the governor um, has adhered to all of the practices and policies um, with her mom that's also in a long-term care facility. And not only do we appreciate that, but we appreciate her role model, um, her being a role model in this because this is incredibly difficult. Um, and to the families and the residents, we'd just like to th say thank you. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for asking questions. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for being a champion for the loved one in your facility. It's really important to us that we get this right. Um, as Secretary Scrace has said, this is a very, very critical population, very high, very vulnerable population. And, and so making sure that we are opening slowly and that we don't have an invitation for all facilities to make sure that um, that we're doing this right is really important. We just really appreciate the responsiveness of the New Mexico Healthcare Association and their participation in not only testing but um, the rapid responses that we do and understanding how it is we can imp improve infection control week by week and getting uh, suggestions and recommendations into the buildings. It's making a difference as we're showing in these slides today. So um, I'd like to go to slide one. Um, visitation. So our requirements uh, is that we want everybody to have visitation as much as possible, but outside. That's our goal, is to have outside visitation in a safe environment. And so what we want to do with that is that we want to have no active COVID cases in any facility. So if you um, are a facility and you have no active COVID cases, then we can take the next step for visitation. Visitors must be healthy. That means they must pass the screening. Um, and, and the background that, that the facilities will, will ask them, the questions that they will ask them. Um, social distancing is absolutely required as well as appropriate PPE must be worn. Um, existing visitation, and this is so important, is that we'd like to thank families again as well as volunteers in the community for being very creative on how to keep residents and the and, and elderly engaged in the community as they've been isolated. We expect the visitation to continue in terms of the telephonic and the window visits as, as well as the um, tablet visits. Um, the Aging and Long-Term Services uh, Department has sent out tablets to every single facility here in the state of New Mexico. We know that the New Mexico Health Care Association has done that as well, and we expect those types of visits to continue routinely. This is in addition to that. In addition, we want the end-of-life and palliative care and hospice visits. They, those are to remain in effect. So again, we are working on this slowly. Next slide, please. So our outdoor visits, our goal on a state strategy is to have outdoor visits um, by appointment. This is, can be done through plexiglass and a barrier visitation, also known as chatterboxes. Um, we want uh, both residents and the visitor to be six feet apart with appropriate PPE or 12 feet apart if the resident is unable to wear masks. 
In addition to the plexiglass visits, um, open window visitation is also permittable. Our goal is to have um, one visit with families per month. And so we're, we're going to be working with the facilities to do that. And our goal is also to begin th to allow this starting next week. Um, we are only going to begin with counties with low case and test positivity rates. Next slide, please. And so this is what it looks like. So we've got um, Bernalillo, Colfax, DeBaca, um, Guadalupe, Harding, Hidalgo, Los Alamos, McKinley, Otero, and, and, and I can't read all this. Sandoval, Santa Fe, San, San Juan, uh, San Miguel, Sierra, Socorro, Taos, Torrance, and Valencia. And so those are the counties that we are going to begin because of the low positivity rates. So um, thank you again for your patience. We will continue to work to, uh, with you. We fully anticipate um, com communicating more uh, as we lay these plans out. And we have also instructed facilities to um, update their visitation policy based on the guidance today and also have them readily available for family members. If we are having any concerns with anything that is going on with those facilities, we are encouraging you to contact the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program at 1-800-432-2080. Thank you. All right, back to me, um, and I'm going to do what I always do to Dr. Grace, is particularly since uh, I'm a constituent uh, of this particular policy directly, given that I've got a loved one in a long-term care facility. Uh, what's changed is that we want more in-person visits. So outdoor is an opportunity for my mother to be able to leave her assisted living go outside in this beautiful weather, have a easy to make, and the facilities are responsible for doing it, three-sided plexiglass screen so she can see me and I can see her. Uh, she should have a mask on when she comes outside. I think it's unlikely that my mother will be a very compliant resident, uh, which is why I have to have that mask on at all times, and that's why we have the plexiglass because residents have very unique issues and we want to make their rights and their comfort uh, and their medical needs number one in getting this addressed. If everyone came to the assisted living on the same day at the same time, you couldn't get everybody outside, you couldn't maintain social distancing, you couldn't get everybody masked up, uh, and you would minimize those opportunities. So I want to make sure that's clear. In-person visits mean Plexiglass means outside. We've been uh, uh, requiring that windows be closed, and uh, that is really difficult. You can't hear, you can't see very well, uh, and now we can open them up. Touching, which I really want to occur, I want to hug my mother, I want to hold her hand, still not allowed. Um, I present too big a risk to not only my mother, but then my mother presents a risk to the CNAs, certified nurse aides who are incredible, and then they present risk to other residents. We need to get to a place where there are more activities for residents to be engaged in inside facilities. We need to do a better job figuring that aspect out, and we need to get to a more routine visitation environment. And let me tell you what's required. The lower the cases get, the more mask wearing and social distancing, the more successful we are, the better we can do at making sure that we open this up. And I will tell you this, that in the counties who are not included, we as New Mexicans have to do everything in our power to get them there. And there's also another population that will have uh, very similar rules, and that is the developmentally disabled population that are also living often in smaller but congregate settings. We have to get this visitation right so that we safeguard the residents, but they are suffering from depression, and so are their family members. And they have exacerbated behaviors and medical conditions that can't be addressed very successfully without that visitation. 
There are 32 states that have some kind of visitation, varied success rates. So we want to make sure that we looked at the best evidence, best practices of other states, and that we have a meaningful application of this effort moving forward. And like many New Mexicans, uh, frankly, um, Secretary, I'm looking forward to meeting my mom outside, putting her in my car, driving to an outdoor location uh, at a dining uh, area in Albuquerque, and having a uh, a libation uh, with my mother. Maybe it's a, a, a glass of champagne to celebrate that we can be together. We're a long way from that. And the likelihood is, Dr. Scrace, it's a vaccine away from that. Is your heart better? Yeah, you're, I could see that you were having a, a bit of an issue over there. And, and that is really what I wanted to get at. This is not going to be easy. Without a vaccine, this is one of the highest risk groups we think we can do it right, otherwise we wouldn't do it at all. But it really is dependent on how much of the virus is out and about in a particular area in the state, and that's that positivity rate. Because if that positivity rate is too high, that means that virus is spreading readily in too many places. And bringing it into the facility is almost a foregone conclusion, which is exactly how they got in to facilities in the first place. So um, this plan, I want to also just quickly do this, has a whole lot more details. Uh, but we wanted to give folks a sense that this is how we start. We want loved ones to have a chance to get much closer. We want loved ones to be able to hear each other. We want to start encouraging those visits. We want to give facilities, uh, empower them with safety guidelines to help us get this right. We think that we are on that path, and we're working diligently to help those communities and counties get to that low positivity rate so that they can be included. And this is so high risk that you can't do it. Statewide policy affects every facility, every resident, every family member. But how we start it, that means when, depends upon those positivity rates. So, all right, my slides, I appreciate that very much. And uh, like many family members, um, I'm ready to do that outside visit by making an appointment sometime after Monday and getting in the queue and hoping they have that plexiglass and making sure I have all the necessary precautions on my end. Um, all right, so I think you know where we are as a state. We're doing really well. Uh, being uh, still in the red category is uh, not good enough. We need to be in that green category, which means we can safely reopen. Why do we want to safely reopen? It means it's safer for kids, and we can regain our momentum in economic recovery. These are critical aspects. The longer it takes, the harder it is. So uh, what we're doing currently is good. We are now trending in the right direction. Last week, uh, not really clear. Week before that, absolutely clear trending in the wrong direction, which is why we had to pause in-person education. So if we keep doing what we're doing, and we think next week we can give you some more data about mask-wearing adherence and that it is working, uh, anecdotally, uh, I like to do both positive and to tell folks where we're still uh, struggling to meet these requirements. Uh, if I say take a drive, uh, don't get out, uh, I adhere to even stricter standards uh, uh, personally about COVID. I think that's good, both role modeling and uh, I know just how unsafe and deadly this virus can be. And I'm not quite in the high risk group by age, but pretty darn close, Dr. Scrace, uh, as a 60 year old. So uh, I, the, I, we want to adhere to these practices. And I have people who work at the residence and who work with me in state government, and I have an obligation to keep them safe. And that means my behaviors impact even the ability to safely do these press conferences. All right, so uh, in, a, in a drive north, I saw several communities uh, between Santa Fe and Dixon. Uh, who uh, appeared to have really good COVID practices on the outside. People who were walking with masks, uh, people who were, uh, it looked like gating um, or metering in some of the retail businesses so the parking lots weren't quite full, uh, a clear adherence for people getting out of their cars, going to shopping and grocery stores. 
Um, and communities where uh, not all of uh, uh, Espanola in that drive looked like they were quite there, where it was universal mask wearing. So it's a, a shout out that they can do better, and I know they will. Uh, but I also visited uh, a public outdoor area near the Rio Grande where people picnic and fish. Uh, and I saw terrible COVID safe practices there in a drive through that parking lot. I saw several families who were gathering in well more than the five uh, limitation. Uh, I saw a uh, music being played, dancing uh, occurring, uh, and no mask wearing. Uh, and it, it's an indication that we're not where we need to be. Uh, those are all citable offenses. I'm not a law enforcement officer. I can't and won't cite you. But it is a real indication for me that when uh, we keep working, we're not quite there. I need New Mexicans to do better. The better and faster we achieve mask wearing, social distancing, and really minimizing our outward contact with others, the more economic recovery we can have, the better we're going to do in education, and the better we're going to do in long-term care visits. Risks high, rewards great. So I really need us to keep going, but I want to also highlight that we're doing much better. And we are trending too early to say uh, that we're uh, out of the woods pre-vaccine, that we can do the kinds of next phases but it is definitely in the right direction. So thank you, New Mexico, and congratulations. And it should show you that every one of us can make a difference and how quickly you can make those changes and see the results. Let's make sure that we do this for the rest of August so that we can do other, and do, make, meet our school deadline, and let's hold these behaviors beyond the vaccine, because these are good public health behaviors that will prevent the spread of influenza, that will prevent the spread of colds, that will really create a much healthier environment in general for New Mexicans. So I think we should start thinking about this as the right public health path. I think Dr. Scrace will love this forever, irrespective of COVID. All right. We have been, frankly, a national leader. This is something that uh, is act not just a shout out to the cabinet uh, and to the medical advisory team, but it's a real shout out to the private public partnership that has existed here uh, during this pandemic. We actually, even though we're still in the red, we have been identified as a national COVID leader in many of the efforts and decisions we've made and the end results. That has a lot to do with New Mexicans, and I am grateful we all are. Let's keep doing it, and um, that's the reward. You get to keep doing it because it makes a difference in saving lives in, uh, for every other uh, aspect in New Mexico. But I do think uh, our family gatherings, and we'll talk more about that uh, in, our, uh, in contact tracing, but family gatherings continue to be a, a real source of high risk for the state. And I know those must be really difficult, which is why Dr. Grace said, please don't uh, celebrate Labor Day in the way that many of us are accustomed to celebrating uh, a long weekend and, uh, and a holiday that's meaningful in making sure that our workers and working families are celebrated and highlighted and that we give ourselves a pat on the back for work well done over a year. But these family gatherings and these picnics and these outings um, are high risk and uh, you need to be at five or under and everyone needs to be in a mask. All right, next slide. All right, I want to keep talking about ramping up for businesses. So the recovery, the recovery, the recovery loan fund that we launched uh, uh, this week, we talked about it last week. It's $400 million. I want to thank, it was a bipartisan piece of legislation out of the special session that we held uh, at the end of June. And uh, it is already showing uh, great success. Yesterday we had more than 100 applications. We're getting about 20 an hour. And the the, it's a very simple application process uh, that also means that the, the, the loans that we're providing get into your accounts so that you can infuse that uh, resource into your business quickly. And it's really intended to support our small businesses that, are, are the, the, that COVID has created such incredible economic stress on. And remember, they're low interest rate loans. And I know folks push back. I get it. That if I'm struggling, I can't have any more debt or burden, even if that interest rate is one and a half percent. 
I'm optimistic about what ends up happening in the next stimulus bill. I'm optimistic as the country recovers what Congress can do in the next several months to make sure that we're all considering whatever investments make our businesses as whole and as risk-free as possible given this worldwide pandemic and this economic crisis as a result. So uh, I, I want folks to be encouraged by this, and I want us to all work together to, to stabilize the economic downturn in the state and around the country and to do everything we can to support our small businesses. You can go to nmfinance.com. Uh, I want to keep telling you that we are going to continue to do any number of projects and programs that are aimed at economic recovery for the state. Next slide. All right, here's some places just to remind you where to go. You can always go to NewMexico.gov and click I Need Assistance. That means that works for both the businesses and individuals, which is really the, the target information for this particular slide. That we have lots of families who are still not working, who now are in high-risk situations because of the uh, lack of an unemployment fix uh, from the Senate or from the Congress. Uh, I want you... I want you to be encouraged by the number of programs in the state. We are clear that folks do not have enough nutrition assistance, utility assistance, housing and rent assistance. We want to help with those and medical issues. I don't believe that we have the tools or resources to solve every problem. But we have sufficient tools and resources to really make a difference. And I want to encourage you, you are not out there alone. And if it's something that we can't find a resolution for, then it will push us to look for other programs and ideas in any number of ways, including in the ways in which we're uh, getting our All Together New Mexico Fund and making it available. We have to do as much as we can to safeguard our families and our businesses in this state. If you want to learn more about food, medical, cash, and energy assistance, go to yes.state.nm.us. If you want to know more about child care, go to newmexicokids.org. If you uh, uh, need assistance directly and you're in crisis, please go to 1-855-NEW-MEXICO-CRISIS. You can go to nmcrisisline.com. The number, of course, is 855-662-7474. The purpose of this slide is to have it up long enough so that people can see there's no wrong door. We have an obligation, and we stand ready and willing to do everything we can. Uh, we want to reduce the stress for families, and I want to recognize that New Mexico is not exempt from the high stress related to the very serious consequences of living through this pandemic. And we believe that we can do, uh, go uh, get a lot done for you and your family in the programs that we currently have. So I encourage you, and I thank you for that. All right, I believe we have no more slides, so we can go to questions. But again, um, these, are hard, these are hard press conferences. As long as there's not a vaccine, we're living in COVID. As long as we're living in COVID, we have to talk about testing and cases and contact tracing and the gating criteria. We have to, to mourn the losses every single day, every single week in New Mexico. It's harsh. But it doesn't mean that we aren't beating back the virus. In fact, these lower case counts and the drop in positivity rate are clear indications that when we said if you restrict where you're going, you do more to stay at home, you wear your mask, that you wash your hands, that you use hand sanitizer, that you're wearing your mask, that these mitigation efforts will in fact really work. And we can create more opportunities for New Mexico and New Mexicans. So I want people to feel good about that. And even though I'm, I hope, I continue to be very clear and firm and straightforward, we will not panic. We will be prepared. We will make the hard decisions. We will follow the science. It's not always what people want to hear, but they should expect great right, transparency and what we're doing and how we do it. It is good news this week. And it should be a, a you know, a, a shout out to our educators as they're preparing and launching distance learning, that we're moving in the right direction. We want them to feel safe. More importantly, we want them to be safe. And we want our children 
to be safe and their families. So good news, New Mexico. Let's keep it up. Um, we'll be back to you about what that looks like next week. But before we end, of course, I'm ready to take questions, Nora. Thank you, Governor. We will start with Algernon, De with Algernon Damasa, excuse me, with the Las Cruces Sun News. Algernon, you are unmuted. Go right ahead. Thank you. Governor, the emergency rule enacted by the PRC to shield some residents from having utility service shut off for non-payment during the emergency is set to expire, and the PRC is going to consider a permanent rule that would extend that through the life of your public health emergency order, but there will be a gap, and during that gap, residents could see uh, services closed off by utilities. The gap apparently is unavoidable. Will the administration be reaching out to utility companies to encourage them or persuade them to uh, sort of grant a grace period during that gap? for the affected residents. Absolutely, and I really appreciate that you point that out. Uh, we have to do everything we can, as that slide indicated, to help families. And I wanna also thank our, our, our rural co-ops, P&M, gas company, uh, that we've got some really incredible partners who have worked, I think, very hard, including the PRC, to protect ratepayers and consumers and make sure that they have uh, their utilities. And uh, sometimes folks around the globe forget about how critical that is. People get very sick or can die of heat exhaustion. If you don't have your utilities on and you're a diabetic, you don't have refrigeration for your medicine. Uh, these are extreme examples, but they are more common in occurrence in states like New Mexico uh, than you might think. It is imperative. People must have their utilities on. We've got to make sure that we don't have a gap. And this administration will make sure that we do everything in our power, including we're going to talk about direct assistance, which is why I think the, uh, Dr. Grace is going to talk about his other day job, which is running uh, the Human Services Department. But we should ask for the grace period, and we'll, we'll also make sure that uh, you hear right now about the benefits that are also available to you. Yes, uh, the Human Services Department provides services, uh, medical coverage to over one million New Mexicans that we touch each year. One of those programs is called LIHEAP, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. It provides assistance to people who can't afford to pay their bills and in particular in response to this question we have a crisis LIHEAP program. So if you've received a disconnect notice uh, or you're out of the fuels you normally use at home, some folks burn wood, uh, propane, uh, hopefully not burning too much wood this summer with the heat, but if we can get a copy of a disconnect notice, uh, go online to Human Services Department in New Mexico or type in L-I-H-E-A-P-N-M-H-S-D. You know those three things that Google will take you right there. Uh, but we'd, we'd actually uh, uh, desire to make sure that no one is in a place where their energy gets cut off this summer, and that's why we have those programs, and we have folks who are ready and willing to help if you Go online or give us a call. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to call that the two-step program. We close the gap by talking to the utility companies. If something goes wrong, you've got the stop gap two-step second part of that human services department. It's got you covered. And so thank you for that question. Thank you, Governor. Next, I will go to uh, Julia Goldberg with the Santa Fe Reporter. Julia, you are unmuted. Go right ahead. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Governor and Secretaries. I have a few questions related to the state's reporting of the recovered COVID-19 cases. Dr. Scrace has explained before the health department only designates cases as recovered when they've had direct communication using the criteria from the MAT team that was published in March. So right now that would be almost 41% of the total cases have been designated as recovered. Um, so my questions are, number one, I'm curious what percentage those recovered cases represent. Um, in other words, have almost 41% of cases maintained contact and they've all been designated as recovered? Um, and, is, and is, in fact, are you using the same criteria from March? And then second, <laughs> does the state have a working assumption about how many active cases it actually has right now? 
And if so, how many? Third, and I'm sorry, I have three questions. Um, I went through and calculated the recovery percentages for each county at a specific point in time, and there's a pretty big spread from 15% up to 74%. And I'm wondering if that simply reflects responsiveness and, and also if it's correlating at all with responsiveness in those counties um, with contact tracing. Sorry, there's so many questions, but I am now finished. Thank you. Yeah, that, I had to write all of those down. Let's see how well I do. I'm definitely going to defer to Dr. Scrace, but I want to lay a framework. Uh, Julia, the reason that these are so important is we are actually going to produce a set of policy statements. You know, you learn about uh, COVID. It's uh, based on the amount of time, right? We react to it. We study it. Uh, you've seen uh, any number of uh, evidence-based national reports that either debunk uh, a particular issue or strategy or reaffirm. Uh, remember early on, New Mexicans, uh, we weren't sure in the world and certainly weren't sure in this country whether very many people would be, uh, w uh, would be infected were asymptomatic, right? The assumption was that everyone basically would have symptoms. We now know that that's not true. So uh, I want to point out that that's coming, and we want to refine, actually, to your point, you know, how do you define recovered? Is that being consistently and, and particularly, do, do, do the counties and the folks, do they only really understand that? Uh, two, uh, I want to, uh, the last question, how you uh, correlate contact tracing and active cases, that is another reason we want to make sure uh, that we uh, get that policy guideline and begin to sort of report those connections. And I can't say whether I have a data point to tell you whether we know unequivocally they're connected. My assumption is they are. Uh, but I'm going to go directly to Dr. Scrace. Uh, thank you, Governor. <clears throat> thank you very much for those questions. I don't have those numeric answers on hand today for you, but we'd, have to, we'd be happy to connect offline. Uh, I'll talk with folks in our epidemiology department. I know that as we've increased our contact tracing capacity, we've had an ability to follow people longer into their illness. Uh, I said earlier that the length of the illness is one thing that keeps people out of the recovered category, but the number one um, reason why we don't move a person from an active case to officially recovered is because we lose contact with them in one way or another. We call, uh, they don't answer. We can't reach them. Uh, I think there are some technology, potentially technology solutions to that. In other countries, they, uh, you know, they uh, commandeer your cell phone and follow you wherever you go, and, and, and yeah, and you have a, a, a bracelet and everything else. We don't do that here in the United States, so it's harder to track. I, I think the biggest issue, really, about recovery, isn't so much the statistics of it as those people who have prolonged illnesses, and you know. One month into COVID, we didn't have any data about people who had illness longer than one month. And, you know, five months in now, we're learning about, you know, 70 percent of people with heart involvement or lung issues or, or other things. So I think that's a evolving science about what recovery is. Uh, Governor mentioned the, the policy statements that are coming out that would help. And I would, I would say, um, before we get you numbers, I've looked at those numbers, too. I've clicked, you know, today. Uh, there are uh, a total of 5,029 cases in Bernalillo County, 21, 22 recovered. And that's pretty much exactly 40 percent. Do I think that more than 40 percent of people who get COVID in New Mexico who we know about uh, have recovered? Yes. I think the other thing to keep in mind is with a, a roughly four to one ratio of uh, four people that we don't know that have had COVID to every one person that we have COVID, who has have had COVID, I'm operating on the assumption that very close to 100% of those people who never even got the test or, uh, are in all likelihood recovered because had they had symptoms, they would have gotten the test. So I think that's one that the whole country and the world is having trouble pinning down. We don't have a standardized uniform definition. We do have one in DOH that is under some revision, but it doesn't, uh, the drafts I've seen don't really change it very much to that idea that uh, you know, you're 10 days out from the onset of your symptoms, you're three days without fever, your other symptoms, if you had any, are on the wane, and for those who test positive with no symptoms at all, it's 10 days to recovery. And so I'll, uh, 
I'll, we'll, we'll work with you to get more specific answers and talk later this week or early next week. Julia, thank you very much. And, and uh, to try to clarify that for uh, New Mexicans, uh, for me, you're basically symptom-free and then a grace period. And we want to make sure that these time frames are consistent. And I, I do think this is a really important question. And I do appreciate, Dr. Grace, that the evolving science, we are doing what we think is the best standard practice. And what we want to do is create a safeguard so that people don't unwittingly, right, still have the virus and uh, uh, are contagious and then spread it. And particularly as we're dealing with healthcare providers who are also giving advice to their patients, right? We want to use a epidemiologically sound definition, and that's been more difficult than, frankly, it's a layperson like me thinks it should be because it seems like it's easy, but when you don't know enough about the virus and you're learning about incubation periods and you're learning that it's not that people uh, take longer to recover than others, some people never even know they've got it, 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 it makes that baseline more challenging, which is exactly why uh, we are updating. And that was the other point of your question. Is it still the same as March? It's going to be largely the same, Julia, but I think there's going to be some narrowing and shifting uh, based on some of those timelines with new data that we're utilizing, not only from New Mexico, but from the CDC uh, and the other places that we go to uh, expert guidance as we make those determinations. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Next, I will go to Morgan Lee with the AP. Morgan, you are, mm, I can't unmute you. All right, Morgan, I'll have to come back to you. Next, I will go to Brandon Evans with KOAT. Brandon, you are unmuted. Go right ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Secretaries. Uh, my questions are just about sports. When we look at the ones that are still kind of up in the air with the University of New Mexico, I wanted to know what your conversations had been with the Board of Regents and if they were thinking about suspending the football season entirely. Uh, the second on sports was New Mexico United. Are we any closer to having them play matches in the state of New Mexico, and oh, are you overall pleased with the way that they are practicing and handling uh, things right now? Uh, all right. Well, uh, I want to do a, a caveat about the sports issues for colleges and UNM universities. Uh, University of New Mexico, part of the Mountain States and uh, Mountain West, and Mexico State, who isn't. Uh, I, I have, as you know, and to remind New Mexicans, I wrote a very, I think, strong but clear letter that we don't think it's safe, uh, particularly given what we're seeing with uh, sports nationally and the number of folks who test positive, ways in which other sports are finding ways to kind of, kind of live in a pod or uh, a vacuum, if you will, so that they're not exposed to the outside world and vice versa, and they're able to manage infections. Uh, I think that we should be delaying, pausing fall sports. I have not had specific uh, direct conversations with the regents. Um, I, I'm not opposed to that at all. I want to remind New Mexicans that uh, I work very hard to make sure that the regents and other policymakers and the presidents get communication from the executive branch about why we think a particular practice or effort or decision ought to be made. The day-to-day -day work of regents in an independent academic institution I have great regard for. And uh, we have set a pretty high bar to make sure that we are not engaging in sort of directly micromanaging those decisions. We shouldn't be. That's why they have a board of confirmed regents. I'm not opposed to having a conversation to see where they are. What are the issues that are causing them to delay? My sense is people are waiting to see what goes on, right? Uh, could that, and I, I mean no disrespect by this. It is easier to sort of join groups that are uh, uh, starting to make these decisions. My job is to make those decisions early enough to provide advance warnings to New Mexicans, to let folks know why we're doing it, to make sure that we're creating an environment where we're lowering, right, the number of cases and the positivity rates. And why do we do that? People are safer. People don't die. Uh, and we can get back to as normal a situation as we can for education and economic recovery. All right. So we often, I would say, New Mexico leads often in those efforts. So I haven't done that. Um, I'm not opposed to doing that. 
my sense, given some of the national media, and that there's been a pause by uh, um, uh, our partners, is that UNM is leaning towards that. I, I need to be, uh, that's my hunch, not based on the mat or scientific evidence. And I think New Mexico State is a bit more hesitant, and I use that to mean not that they're not trying to be good partners, but they're evaluating different sets of information and criteria. I think it's still really risky, and I appreciate all the different groups who are very clear that pausing is the right way to move forward, because if you introduce this risk and you have spread between your athletes and your coaches, then you have spread between uh, the required in-person higher education uh, activities, and it means that we upset that whole apple cart uh, about higher education. And the goal is not to do that and save lives, both. I think United has done uh, a very effective job in these ways, and I want to make sure that this is an opportunity for me to give them a shout-out. They're in a really tough environment. Where they play in other states, they're allowed to play. Here, they're not. Uh, in other states, those practices are allowed in less restrictive ways. You'll notice in those ready-to-open areas, they're in the bruised red category, and they've had a much higher mortality rate and a much higher uh, case rate, and they've had a nearly over overwhelming hospitalizations and other issues that put their health care providers at risk. We haven't done that. Uh, I stand behind those decisions. They wear masks. They promote wearing masks. They socially distance. They ask their fans not to travel with them. If they do, they tell them they have to quarantine when they get back for 14 days. Uh, I want to give them all of those accolades because that makes it really difficult. Um, given that we've been making pretty strict recommendations and decisions where we have control, like in K through 12 sports, you know, we've said contact sports are too high risk. There have been any number of COVID safe practice conversations like we do with every organization and business. Is there a way to make it safe here? And they've offered any number of things, including that they would create that pod environment. Everyone lives in the same place. Nobody's allowed to go out. They got to sign affidavits. They do health screenings and then allow them to practice. And they believe, uh, like some of our football teams uh, nationally, that they can manage in that same way. Well, they're pointing to evidence that indicates that that does seem like it does work. So we are looking at that evidence, and I uh, appreciate that they're giving us time, that we can't have it just be anecdotal one see it apply in a couple of places, but we might be able to make decisions that would allow them to continue to promote their COVID safe practices and to practice uh, in a more routine fashion without those 14 day quarantines. But yes, they have, to my knowledge, not only in their social media posts and their promotions, they have met every single one of our requirements. And if they don't, they're clear that they would be part of a uh, enforcement action. And um, I would like, again, our goal is to get more folks to do more normalized efforts because our positivity rates are low, more decisions have been made, we have fewer cases per week, we lower our rolling average right to closer to the 100. Uh, these are all the kinds of signs that we can do more, and I'm hopeful and I hope that that gives New Mexicans and United uh, the kind of boost that they are hoping for because they're practicing COVID safe practices, but I hope it's not the same information that our universities take away. My hope is they'll come to the conclusion sooner rather than later that they should postpone their contact fall sports. Oh, Dr. Grace. Uh, just one quick comment. Thanks, Governor. Uh, you know, I saw a photo in June, I believe, of a packed soccer stadium in New Zealand that I thought was a joke or from five years ago. And it's not a joke. Their case count is zero or one or two at the time. And I just want to reinforce what the governor said, that if you want sports or anything uh, that we can't do now to happen, the way every New Mexican can do that is wear a mask and socially distance. Like, the ambient case count is, you know, it's, we talked about it a couple weeks ago with respect to schools. Uh, we're talking about it now with respect to nursing facility visitation. Every single thing that we want to do will be a lot safer to do if we have a low level of cases. So, again, uh, 
if, you know, I, you know, if you've heard me say, there's simply some things that we have to live without for a year during the middle of a pandemic, but I don't know that this has to be one of, uh, one of them. New Zealand figured it out. They just masked up and, and contact traced and drove their cases down, and they're back doing some things they want to do. So why don't we try that as well? Well, Dr. Grace, I tried to take on some of your evidence-based definitions, and you took on my good, thank you, messaging that we, we have the power to determine our future. Our future doesn't have to be as narrow as we've laid out in order to maintain public health, safety, and well-being. That is really up to each of us. And the better we do, the more opportunities you provide for the state to relax restrictions and to engage in much broader um, uh, economic recovery opportunities. And that is exactly what we desire to do. Next question. Thank you, Governor. All right, I'm going to come back to Morgan Lee with the AP. Morgan, you are unmuted. Go right ahead. Uh, hello, thanks for this opportunity. Um, Governor, uh, Secretaries, I wonder if you could talk about where things stand with the, uh, the film industry and um, the timetable for reopening. And, um, and also, I know it's a, a big subject, uh, but if you could touch upon um, how you think uh, autonomous tribes, nations, how their um, uh, tribally owned uh, businesses are handling things. Um, thank you. Um, so the film industry uh, there, I think, we have clarified that uh, all their construction is part of the essential business work, uh, and they're doing now their work on movie sets that if you are reading our public health order as uh, carefully as we expect you to, Morgan, that the, the clarification of essential and non-essential businesses and uh, media work should give rise to that we think that we've got larger categories for folks to begin to come back to work and to the film industry's credit. They've done incredible work on COVID safe practices. So that is the answer that I think that's already available. Um, two, I already forgot the second question, Morgan. That always happens to me. Um, oh, tribal businesses. Uh, frankly, uh, Morgan, I think it's been uh, mixed. Uh, I think that uh, uh, certainly um, we've, we know that we had an outbreak at the end of the Mountain Gods. I, I want to give a shout out to the leadership of the Mescalero Apache Nation uh, that contacted us immediately. They're working on both collectively with us contact tracing and, of course, working through Indian Health Services, their contact tracing. I think they're struggling and have asked us to hold some of our quarantining restrictions for tourism, even though they depend on tourism for their casinos and their hotels. Uh, I think that they are struggling to make sure that both their COVID safe practices are working, but they, they minimize risk into their communities. Uh, I think uh, it's fair to continue to say that I would not if, uh, just like we, we haven't opened up uh, uh, gaming that's not part of a sovereign nation where the state shouldn't have and doesn't have, right, the ability to make decisions about how they do things in a sovereign nation. I, I do worry about the fact that we've, you know, held everybody else up in what I would identify as large group and entertainment venues. And I think it's been mixed. I don't think that any sovereign nation has minimized COVID safe practices. So restricting the number of machines, doing uh, what I would call metering for participants, requiring everybody to wear masks, taking temperatures. Uh, we have not seen uh, uh, the kind of uh, a spread that would be indicate, indic indicative, I'm sorry, indicative of a problem at say places like Isleta, but uh, along the I-40 corridor, I've seen an increase in cases uh, in some of those gaming um, uh, tribes. So I, I think it's a mixed set of outcomes, and we continue to work with our sovereign nations to be very cautious about reopening all their businesses, and particularly to reopen uh, their casinos. And so um, I think it's just depended. Um, but I, they are all adhering to the same COVID safe practices voluntarily that we would require for any of those businesses in the same settings. 
Thank you, Governor. Next, I will go to Jens Gould with the Santa Fe New Mexican. Jens, you're unmuted. Go right ahead. Hi, Governor, Secretaries. Um, Governor, you mentioned the subject of a vaccine a couple times today. The National Governors Association has urged governors to start planning for the vaccine effort now um, and said there was a high degree of uncertainty about the exact processes and procedures that will be used for operations and administration of the vaccine. So I wanted to ask you, um, what has the state done already to plan those operations and logistics and the administration of the of a vaccine, uh, an eventual vaccine, uh, and, and what those operations and logistics will be, um, who will administer the vaccines, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think that states don't tend to have an existing infrastructure for that sort of thing. Um, so wondering if the state is building that now. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I know that Dr. Scrace is uh, itching to answer this because he is tasked with actually making this work, but I want to do a couple highlights. One, uh, New Mexico uh, has a robust partnership with private sector folks. So even in our childhood vaccination efforts, right, public health is a place where you can uh, get immunizations, but it is by no means the only place. By far, the vast number of vaccinations that are both required for healthcare uh, workers and first responders and school-aged children are administered by the private sector, and I have no reason to believe that we would try to shift that in any way. So you should expect the same kind, that, just like we've done with testing. It'll be public health will do that, so will our private sector healthcare providers will also be doing that. Uh, the NGA, the National Governors Association, is worried about a couple of things. The state is uh, included in that group. You might recall that New Mexico was arbitrarily, in my opinion, designated early in the testing aspects as a Tier 2 state. I don't know even know what that meant. Uh, is it based on population? Uh, is it based on uh, low community spread at the time? Is it based on that we did early stay-at-home orders, so they thought we were going to be able to manage the virus differently? I, I don't know what that was, but it really prohibited us from getting all the testing supplies early on and getting all of our laboratory instruments approved by the FDA to run COVID tests. Uh, I found that to be highly problematic. So the NGA is, rightfully, just exactly what is the criteria. Uh, is it high-risk populations and healthcare providers? That's going to be corrections, nursing homes, healthcare workers. Uh, is it going to be all the other chronic care populations? I would argue that it's got to be, in which case New Mexico would be in a high-risk state category given our health status uh, issues and chronic care issues in this state. So we're looking to get the federal government to already utilize influenza-type criteria in making that vaccine available and to give us assurances because they've said look we have all the things that we need right the the vaccination commodity right the needle and the vial and uh, we're, we'll have uh, uh, enough of those to go around well are they and how many is that what's going to happen worldwide and so those are the unsettled issues that I think the NGA rightfully so is wanting very clear um, you have it. We are all going to have to uh, uh, compete for it because that is an outrageous. It's exactly how we got in to the problems that we're currently having. This has to be a smart, evidence-based effort to make sure that you start with those high-risk groups and then you roll out getting vaccines widely available, and they're telling us they're going to be widely available. But we have to plan for a process. So, yes, we're doing the planning not New Mexico's first rodeo in having a shortage of vaccine, not my first rodeo in, in doing that, and so we've been laying the foundation so that we don't get underrepresented in that effort. Dr. Scrace. Yeah, uh, just a couple things to add, Governor. It's a really important question, and I, got, I have a couple things to say. First, uh, the team has been planning this in DOH since mid-June, and so very active effort going on. It involves uh, a lot of different departments in the, in the state government, not just DOH. HSD is involved because of our Medicaid population. Secretary Hodrum Lopez here may want to comment on what's happening uh, for senior populations, a very, very important group to, uh, to get vaccinated as well. I, I just want to underscore that the first step in uh, a significantly effective plan to vaccinate everyone for COVID is first getting everyone 
effectively vaccinated for influenza and getting those kids the back to school uh, uh, shots as well. Uh, DOH has a workforce. I mean, they're the people out there doing, you know, these thousands and thousands of nasopharyngeal swabs every day across the state. They have a public health office in every county, at least one, uh, more than one in some of the larger counties, and they are poised to do that. And lastly, I completely agree with the governor that um, this is going to be a public-private partnership. Most of us who have access to a care provider will in all likelihood find a way to get the vaccine um, in that office or that location. And also to point out too that we have other distribution systems that are already in effect. Remdesivir, we found a way uh, to distribute that to all the hospitals in the state. Uh, and now the federal government's doing direct distribution at our direction. So I think this is something, as the governor said, not our first rodeo, and uh, that um, we've had experience with H1N1 uh, 11 years ago that we can rely on as well. And then just finally, uh, I, I have a couple lifelines texting me. It was not a soccer match. In New Zealand, it was rugby. And on the uh, recovered cases slide, there are three roles uh, that relate to this in DOH. There's the case investigators. They're the ones who call the positive cases, uh, get the information. The contact tracers who call the contacts. And then there are monitors who actually follow these other folks. Uh, DOH first staffed up uh, the case investigators for this pandemic. Uh, now nearing the end of uh, staffing up the contact tracers and are in the process of staffing up uh, those monitors to track people down more effectively to close some of these cases. Thank you. And I don't know if the secretary has anything to add, but as she does, I also want to remind New Mexicans that we also have uh, uh, what I'm going to call advanced certifications by pharmacists who can also aid in uh, vaccination. So this is a state that looks at any number of ways that, uh, to be available. I also want to make this comment. Given the, 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 the depth of this crisis in the United States, I do want New Mexicans, and I'm prepared, that it will likely not go as smoothly as it's being indicated it will. Uh, and I hope I'm wrong, but we have to prepare that it will be like testing, and it's going to be like uh, making sure that we're, there's real clarity about this crisis, about how you report data, about what the data means, that the CDC is on the same page as HHS, that HHS is on the same page as the White House, that the White House is following the expertise of folks like Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx. Uh, when that doesn't occur, uh, you have a, a confusion and delayed actions and responses that can be harmful and problematic to state's best planning efforts. So there's that very high degree of likelihood that it won't be as promised. Uh, and it is also very difficult to manufacture m hundreds of millions of doses of a new vaccine. And while they're all saying that they're ready to do that, I, I, I want to believe them. I have plan A, believe them, it's all here. Plan B, uh, which is where can we go, how do we do it, and how do we safeguard New Mexicans to the highest degree possible. So I just want New Mexicans to be prepared for the worst and to take the opportunity, and we'll be ready for that, for the best. Uh, it's premature to know what will happen, but I want you to be ready. Uh, Secretary, do you have something to add? Um, I do. Thank you, Governor. Um, we have received a, a lot of calls through the, um, aging, to the Aging and Long-Term Services Department from seniors asking about this vaccination. And again, what we want to be able to promote today is, again, get vaccinated for influenza. That is our first step. That is our first line of defense. We are working closely with the New Mexico Department of Health and um, HSD in order to not only promote, but also promote and provide access through our aging network network to make sure that we have a public-private partnership and that we push the, um, the vaccination and, and the promotion for people to get vaccines for um, influenza first and then work on the other phases. And so thank you very much for that question. It's really important for us to um, make sure that we are protecting ourselves for, at, with what's available today and, and in the future, and that is first influenza. Thank you. Thank you, Governor and Secretaries. Next, I'll go to Chris McKee with CareQE. Chris, you are unmuted. Go right ahead. 
Thank you very much. Um, I had two quick questions related to virus kind of testing vaccine stuff. One of them, the New York Times published a quick uh, article about antigen testing, kind of, you know, alluding to the idea that the quicker tests are less precise, but faster in producing results, and they may help identify community spread a little bit more. Just wondering if New Mexico is uh, at any point with antigen testing, looking into it, or at any level there. Uh, vaccine trials, uh, as part of, of course, the federal government's Operation Warp Speed, a lot of companies are pushing out more trials, uh, or expected to over the next few months, I should say. Are you aware of any private companies looking into New Mexico um, for potential locations for trials? And then uh, a question for the governor, do you have any me re message for restaurants and restaurants owners out there as they're probably seeing the results today, still a little bit disappointed, I imagine, for not um, being able to do indoor dining again this week as well? Well, yeah, thanks a lot for assuming I can't answer any of these questions about antigens or antibodies. You're grounded, Chris, but yes, we should go to the expert. Uh, but for, for, for all the lay folks out there, uh, antigens and antibodies are proteins that can tell you, A, if you've got COVID or if you've had COVID. Antigen is a protein that in, in layman's terms, it will get fixed, uh, it could tell you that you've got the virus. Uh, and uh, yes, we know that you can get that available in New Mexico now by some private partners. It's not part of our overall testing strategy. Part of it is you have to then go after a different supply chain. And you might remember that we were interested in doing some antibody tests to figure out how many people might have been exposed. Uh, that proved to be, and there is some antibody testing also available in New Mexico. It is not the cornerstone of our testing efforts, largely because it changes which instruments we're using uh, and what method of collection rate, blood tests versus um, uh, the nasal pharyngeal swabs, uh, uh, and figuring out who, what, when, and where, and which manufacturers. We've been in touch, and I could say I have been directly in touch with one of our companies, Roche, uh, who is, uh, uh, has FDA approval for their antigen test. And what I do is I find out what's available, when it's available, how it got its uh, emergency use authorization from the uh, FDA, which you must have in this effort. I provide that information along with other folks Folks to the medical advisory team. They research and make decisions about what's the most effective way to support and uh, uh, test New Mexicans. So that's a very important question. Uh, and the uh, short answer is yes, we always look at that. And we're going to get a specific um, two. Uh, there are companies that have reached out. I would say in a, in, in the best way to categorize it's kind of a non-specific way. So they haven't said there'll be a trial in New Mexico. But as an example, one such company, Pfizer, has certainly identified that they're interested in Western states and that they're working on uh, any number of their particular vaccine and treatment products. Uh, there's been no specific that I know to any provider research institution like the University of New Mexico or research lab to be engaged in that clinical trial. Uh, to my knowledge, it's not occurring in New Mexico, but there might be a different answer. And quickly before you go, you ready? Hang on to it, Dr. Grace. Now, I do have a message for restaurants. Uh, the, I am disappointed beyond words that we have the kind of economic crisis and the kind of risk to an invisible enemy that creates the kind of risk that reduces our ability to safely do indoor dining. Anybody who says that they are satisfied or happy with restricting access to one of the foundations of economic success for a tourism state uh, and a state that's a hot destination for food isn't clear about what drives some of our best economic results. I'm incredibly disappointed. Uh, this virus is so contagious that that is too risky. And while I appreciate that I have a uh, fact finder that says we read our powers correctly, we utilize them correctly, uh, and that we're doing it uniformly, those are important tests. Uh, when we make hard decisions, we want to make sure that we're doing it correctly. I want us to be able to do that. I am just like the nursing home visitation and just like in-person schools. I want very much 
to do more economic recovery, including looking for ways uh, to do more for restaurants. And you've seen us be really creative with the patio dining and the outdoor licenses and tents with three sides open because we don't want them to fail. I, I, nobody wants that. But we do need people to be COVID safe and compliant because if they're not, you can't do the rest of it. So I'm disappointed that we're in a global pandemic that has been so difficult to manage or mitigate and that so many restaurants are negatively affected. But I do appreciate the recognition by the court that we're doing it correctly. New Mexicans should expect that we will not arbitrarily and capriciously make any decision, that we will do that thoughtfully based on the powers that we have, and we'll do it fairly. Dr. Scrooge. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh uh, the MAT uh, testing team is working hard uh, this week, this weekend, and early next week on four testing-related issues, pooling, uh, which is combining specimens for greater efficiency, antigen testing, which is your question, saliva, use of saliva, and then just uh, potential for new equipment that could speed up our, our testing throughput or turn around time. Far and away, the nasopharyngeal swab run on a laboratory bench machine is the most accurate. And interestingly, I, I was just texting uh, with one of the governor's staff this morning, but isn't there a trade-off, though, if we can get more rapid results, uh, wouldn't that be better? And so let me just explain uh, both of those things quickly. Uh, antigen tests just pick up the virus in a different way than finding their RNA, uh, and, so, and they are more quick to turn around. And so those would help. Uh, the sensitivity is lower. And sensitivity means answers the question, what percent of people who actually have COVID will have a positive test when they have it? With our nasopharyngeal swabs, we're well over 90% on the machines we use. And, uh, and with that nasopharyngeal sampling, because it's the best place to get the virus. Um, also, a swab is used for the um, antigen testing. Uh, so they're not an issue there. But uh, some of these tests, well, number one, we can't use anything that's not FDA approved, and a lot of them are going through that process. Uh, number two, um, some of these tests have a sensitivity of 75%. What that means is for every four people that come through who actually have COVID, you're going to tell three of them that they have COVID and one that they do not. And that's a big problem because if that one person who finds out that their test is negative, ignores the advice of the Department of Health and says, well, you know, you had a contact with a case, let's say, you really need to quarantine for 14 days and they go out. Uh, uh, less adequate laboratory tests can actually increase spread. And so it kind of almost defeats the purpose of contact tracing. There are some areas where these kind of tests and other quick turnaround PCR tests, the viral RNA tests, may be of use and may perform better um, we know that if you're in people who have acute symptoms of COVID and they've only had them for a couple days, the sensitivity goes way up. We know in asymptomatic patients, uh, they're not at all suited for that sort of testing and should be highly avoided. Uh, it's recommended right now that they're not used for healthcare workers and uh, nursing home staff because you don't want someone relying on a test that's just not as good as it can be to drive back to work and start taking care of patients. So we're studying it intensively. Uh, all four of those topics will have more information next week. I'll make sure I, I, I'll put a slide in on the pre press conference uh, next week about where we are with antigen testing. I think it holds promise. And between that and pooling, I believe that uh, we, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, actually uh, uh, almost double our testing if we can uh, Figure that out. And then one last thing on restaurants that I guess I get to make more than one HSD comment today, which is very exciting to me because I, I love my work at the Human Services Department. We, do, we are pushing the waiver that we've submitted to Food and Nutrition Services to allow SNAP recipients to purchase takeout food um, at restaurants. And I think, and just another reminder to all of us that we can do everything. Um, uh, there's still a lot we can do to support restaurants, uh, takeout, outdoor dining. And, uh, but we're working on the HSD side with the Food and uh, Nutrition Services to see if we can get that waiver to allow SNAP recipients to get that takeout as well. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, Governor. Next, I will go to Dan Boyd with the Albuquerque Journal. Dan, you're unmuted. Go right ahead. 
Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Governor and, and Secretaries. I'll try to keep this short because I, I know we're, time's getting on and our deadlines are approaching. Um, just wanted to follow up a little bit uh, on the last question, but uh, given the gating criteria that Secretary Scrace talked about and some of the recent positive trends, uh, you know, would you consider easing some of the business restrictions, including restaurants, uh, before the end of the current uh, public health order, which I believe goes through almost the end of August? Thanks. Dan, it's possible uh, that the two big goals are education. Uh, here's what states, including this one, have learned. That uh, a two, uh, we look at seven-day trend lines. We look at cohesive data over the 14-day period because we can really see what's coming and we can look back and see what didn't work. We can tell what happened after Memorial Day weekend. We can tell what happened after July 4th. We can tell what happened when we opened more businesses that we see these spikes. Those spikes then create problems for the other policies that we have. And so I'm looking for that balance. It is possible. Certainly that's what we desire to do. But we, I, I, we need to know frankly, that for 30 days almost, right, the, the life, that's your point, of the public health order, that the, that the trend we've seen this past week, which is good, can continue. And then I have to expect, we all do, that even with our best behaviors, when you introduce any new risk, you will have an increase in cases. The question then is, I've seen that our hospitalizations seem stable, that mask wearing seem to be making a difference, that our high-risk populations that are most likely to need hospital care, that they are staying home, they've been very COVID compliant. We can see we've shifted to a younger population, which, which not entirely, but does reduce somewhat the risk of hospitalizations uh, and, uh, and mortality, although we, we, we lost today younger people, right? I think 40 and 50. So this notion that if you're younger, you won't have any long-term consequences from COVID or that you couldn't be hospitalized or God forbid that you would lose your life is untrue. Uh, it, we've lost little ones around the country to COVID. It's just not true. Those risks are real. Um, even if the prevalent rates aren't like they are for older people with chronic care conditions, they're there. But I do, I think, and the Mexicans are really demonstrating that we can control the spread of the virus. We can't get rid of it, but we can control it to the degree that we're living with it better, that we're reducing the spread, which means we can do more things. And that New Zealand um, example is a really good one. We are also subject to what's going on around us. And we do have New Mexicans who commute and have to work in our essential businesses. Uh, uh, no one's asked me about this, and maybe you'll ask me about how it's going next week, but we've made some exceptions and amendments to the quarantine order uh, for uh, medical care that folks need out of state and for uh, child visitation requirements and, uh, for families where you've got parents that, and I'll, I'll use this as an example, uh, someone that lives in Raton and someone that lives in Trinidad, right? You've got to be you're crossing state lines. We want to make sure that we're not requiring those parents to quarantine. And we've got some, so we're, we, we made some adjustments. And I think it's possible we'll make more adjustments. So that was a, a long way because I've learned this lesson, that when we say, yes, we're doing really well, somehow the next day, businesses open and they seem confused, and then they get uh, uh, an enforcement order. I don't want that. New Mexicans uh, take it as an invitation to vacation and travel and to go across the state borders and county borders and to go to 10 places instead of four and to have a family backyard barbecue. These are not invitations. It's still unsafe out there. COVID exists. But yes, we are doing exactly what I hoped New Mexico would do. And let's do it better. Let's be, let's be the New Zealand, as an example, of the United States. There is no reason we can't do that. We can't accomplish that. I believe in us that much. Uh, I hope you do too, Dan, and I hope you write that. New Mexico can uh, be in a situation where we can manage much more effectively with COVID and we can have much better economic recovery. Thank you, Governor. Just a couple more questions before we wrap up. We'll go to Chris Keller with Albuquerque Business First. Chris, you're unmuted. Go right ahead. Uh, yes. 
Chris, do we have you there? Chris, do we have you? Chris, do we have you there? I heard you for a second. All right, I'm going to mute Chris. Chris, we'll come back to you. I'll go to Matt Grubbs with New Mexico PBS. Matt, you are unmuted. Go right ahead. Thanks, Nora. Thanks, Governor and Secretaries. Um, I had a couple questions, but I would like to get back to Chris, so I will just do one. Um, it, I missed a little bit of Secretary Hotram Lopez, so I apologize if you've covered this, and if you have, just go ahead and skip it. But um, all of you can answer as well, based on your backgrounds. Um, We've heard a lot about the physical health of the older population. I'm wondering about the mental health. I know it's already an isolated population um, and underserved in some respects. Um, how are they doing? Do you have any information, either anecdotally or, or hard data, on whether they're utilizing some of the services that you've provided? Thanks, population. Yeah, uh, Matt, I'm going to actually uh, give you a personal reaction, and I think both secretaries can. Uh, talk about it. And while we covered some of this in our nursing home visitation proposals, uh, they bear repeating. Uh, my mother uh, in an assisted living in Albuquerque has access through actually another provider, not the state, um, uh, to a uh, uh, device so that she and I can FaceTime. She can't do it by herself. Uh, a CNA has to be available, which means I have to be, and so does my mom, respectful of the other residents. Uh, it's also used for medical appointments and evaluation, so it's, it, I can call, as an example, and I have 15 times in a day and I can't get through. I can call on a regular phone 15 times and not get through, and I have no idea. That has caused me, when I'm worried, to jump in a car early in the morning, middle of the day, middle of the night, and drive to that assisted living so I can see her and make sure she's okay. She is often not okay. Uh, she is having trouble with waking, sleeping, and she gives me permission, New Mexicans. She's been really good about making sure that families know what to look for and if she can help do that. And as an advocate for someone who had significant health care issues, my mom is an incredible person. Depression. Uh, that has led to some physical consequences that have led to some hospitalizations. So I have no doubt that the physical issues that are problematic, that require support, and, you know, no one's better at knowing when she's about to be really sick or when she might have a UTI before doing uh, uh, the right laboratory work. I know that because I've known her for, uh, well, let's see, how old am I? So 59 years, uh, 61 years. Um, I know. I know when there's an issue. Without families and without visitation and without getting this right, their behavioral health is negatively impacted and so is their physical well-being. That also has a dramatic impact on safeguarding health care workers and health care providers because it means they're moving uh, out of the facilities for emergency room care and hospital care. So I, I know without having data that it's true. I knew without COVID that we know that without visitation and support that it's true, that hasn't changed, and now it's exacerbated. So I'm actually going to go to Dr. Scrace first and then uh, uh, Secretary uh, Hotram uh, Lopez, because this is a really significant area for us to get right. We are going to get it right, uh, and I hope to be one of those appointment. Probably my brother will beat me to it, um, but my mom, like everybody's mom and spouse and aunt and uncle, uh, son or daughter, deserves an opportunity in the safest possible environment to get a good review and, and a visit by a loved one and someone who can help their health care providers know what their current health care risks and behavioral health risks really are. Dr. Yeah, uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, a great question, and I'm one that I've been really thinking about a lot over the past couple of weeks. Uh, with the electronic medical record, I can put an automated prompt in for me to ask people things, and I've got a little COVID paragraph now where I run through and see what people are doing to keep safe. And I added a question on Monday morning about loneliness. Uh, you know, are you experiencing more loneliness? And uh, slightly over half the people said yes. One of the, only one of those, that was probably about a dozen, only one of, the, one of those folks, did we need to do something like uh, a medi medication modification? 
but a couple other things to think about. Number one, the fatality rate in uh, people over 80 is 40% if they get COVID. And so th that's, this group of individuals is more likely to know people or have had friends who they lost to the disease. And the second issue is that, um, and I don't think, uh, this is just a, something that will change in society, but uh, technological ability, ability to use um, uh, iPads or set up a video visit. Um, and we're working really hard in our office to get everyone on a video visit because I really want to see them, but it's, a cha it's more of a challenge for people. And, and, and then there's the changes in aging where dialing your phone is, can even be tricky with uh, decreased vision. Uh, so uh, the last thing I have to say before uh, I turn it over uh, to C Katrina, to Secretary Hodrum Lopez, is that, you know, call your grandma, call your grandpa. You know, this is a time when you know how to use the technology, set them up, figure out a more frequent way, because people in this age group are already isolated anyway, uh, through the loss of uh, their spouse often, uh, other, other friends. Uh, it's a great time for us to reach out to them and help hold them up uh, to get them through this to we're all vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, and that, that is such an important question for us and, and one that we struggle with quite a bit. Um, with the long-term care ombudsman program, we are advocates for resident rights in long-term care settings, but we're not just seeing um, depression and mental health issues um, that are exacerbated in long-term care settings. Just like, like we've said, we're starting to see that um, staff are reporting that, um, that, that individuals are failing to thrive and in, in being in these isolated in these nursing facilities. Um, one point I do want to make is that um, although uh, people are living in nursing facilities and long-term care facilities and they've got a quarantine, that doesn't mean that they should be absent of any sort of sunshine or fresh air and they can go out and they should be escorted out safely with the appropriate PPE to have some of that, um, you know, just being outside and, and having some of those little pieces of normalcy that they don't often get. Um, we are seeing that, that mental health issues um, and, and behavioral health issues and depression, ex, ex, people are experiencing that both in long-term care facilities and in the community. We've um, actually had something called the Create and Connect campaign through Aging and Long-Term Services and actually we would love to have more people volunteer, but we have found with our Create and Connect campaign that um, letter writing is really connecting with um, the elders it, that are in our communities and in our long-term care facilities. And so it's not always that new tech technology that works, but it's also um, the technology or the way that, that it was done in the past that really resonates with these folks. And so again, we want to um, promote our Create and Connect campaign. Anybody that is interested in volunteering, we definitely want you on there. Um, go to nmaging.state.nm.us. Um, it has been um, highly successful, and, and we have different versions of that in different communities. I know in Las Cruces, um, a, a mother that has been staying home uh, has a couple of kids, and um, and partnered with a local uh, long-term care facility to go um, take those iPads one to another uh, with two little girls on there that just talk about nails and hair and anything else and that's really brought happiness. Although we do, people are, are missing visitation from their loved ones, there are many in the community that don't have loved ones that can visit. And so reaching out and connecting in these alternative ways are so important. But we are seeing this, um, and that's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to start the visitation process in these long-term care facilities, again, starting on Monday, Con we, we had um, the, the, the allowable counties on your screen. Contact your facility. We expect to, that you'll make an appointment. There'll be plexiglass uh, visitation allowed outside as well as an open visit or, or open window visit. Um, and we are hoping to make a difference. And please, if you are sick or have any sort of, um, you know, feeling illness or anything, please do not go to the facility. We need to protect this population. Thank you. And, and I know we're going to one more question. Uh, but it's also, uh, and uh, the, thank you, Secretary, for your Connect uh, program, and uh, you, I forgot all about that, so I appreciate that. But we've got a lot of um, spouses 
uh, in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who were also separated from the spouse that's in a long-term care facility. And the same issues of isolation and depression and anxiety uh, and lack of access, you know, to health care is affecting them as well. I mean, I think it uh, will round it up by ending here on this question. COVID is vicious. It is the worst possible set of global issues for us all to navigate. And that is why we take them so seriously. And there are a ton of unintended health consequences for any number of populations and economic uh, consequences. And navigate them safely, productively, and prudently is the design that we are undertaking. And we think it is showing real success. We've had some, you know, more challenging weeks than others. Um, but let's get this right, because uh, we can save more lives by creating a productive connection and visit. And we're clear about that. And that was our last question. That was it. All right. So uh, I hope that this was uh, good news for folks. Uh, I feel very good about the efforts and personal responsibility of New Mexicans. I also want to do a shout out to businesses. Uh, on, uh, we've got many enforcement actions still occurring. Uh, we are, uh, I, I want to see that number dramatically reduced. Uh, we had 169 uh, uh, rapid responses. I need that dramatically reduced. That means that we're doing better at containing spread and managing community spread of this infection. Uh, but we've got a ton of businesses who actually reach out to us and talk to us about better COVID safe practices, who are working through COVID safe practices, who are leaders in their communities, who are leaders in their industries. Uh, we've got industries who have really suffered economically, but have asked us to take even stricter uh, standards in terms of our public health orders. You know, New Mexico has stood up, and frankly, uh, we have stood out as one of those states. It says a lot about who we are. We are strong. We are resilient. We can do more. We should be doing more. The more we do, the quicker we recover, the more opportunities we have, the better protections we're going to have for our educators, our healthcare workers, our children, our families, and our nursing home or long-term care facility residents. So let's do this, uh, and let's show the rest of the country how it's done, uh, and let's learn to live in a better publicly health conscious world. Thank you, New Mexico, uh, and I appreciate that you tune in for so long.